Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong, and we're really glad you're here. Let me share screen, and let's get going. Tonight, uh, we will be continuing our conversation about the double empathy problem. Um, the double empathy problem um, uh, being about perspective taking and the consequences of what happens when there is a mismatch of worldview and communication style. And gosh, there are oodles of examples of that in healthcare, isn't that for sure? So um, first, if you're new to All Brains Belong, uh, we're a nonprofit organization working to make life better for people with all types of brains. And um, we say that in order to do anything, uh, we have to do everything. So we have programs in all of these different buckets, um, medical care, social connection, employment support, and here we are in education. Um, so Brain Club is our education program intentionally created to provide the public with education about our approach to neuroinclusive community culture. Um, it's our goal to promote new ways of thinking and being and to uh, contribute to systems change. And, and, and um, what we ex hope that you'll experience here at Brain Club is a place where you feel safe, where you can experience how culture can be different, and a place where together we can learn and unlearn. And as you just heard, though we have uh, different types of programs that do different things, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. And it becomes really important when we talk about healthcare. Um, I personally, I'm actually pretty stressed out every time we talk about healthcare at Brain Club in full transparency, because it gets confusing sometimes. It gets confusing. Um, what do you mean? Why are we talking about healthcare? But what do you mean you can't give me medical advice in the middle of Brain Club? Yeah, I mean, I can't give you medical advice in the middle of Brain Club because this is about the collective. This is about the system. We're gonna be talking about the healthcare system today, which is like a different brain space than often we are thinking about when it comes to health. Um, so we do invite you to explore today's big picture theme and to share ideas or reflections related to the topic of discussion. And of course, you know, um, uh, there, there, there are going to be um, some topics that come up tonight around healthcare that can be really stressful even to think about, and so we're gonna um, just, in in full disclosure, just kind of talk about some of that before before we begin. Um, but first, uh, we begin all of our All Brains Belong programs um, by naming that all paths to participation are welcome. You can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. Um, we certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or anything like that. So um, please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or take breaks or, or any of that. Um, you are welcome to interact um, in the chat. Uh, you are also welcome to observe because observation is a valid form of participation. In addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this be a safe uh, space for all participants, we do prioritize the group's needs over that of the individual. And so some of the ways that we do that, we tread um gently and cautiously around sensitive topics. And we, we think about access needs, the group's access needs. Access needs being anything that is required for full and meaningful participation in whatever anyone's doing. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. And um, so for example, um, Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. But if not, look for the more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. That's my visual support to open the chat box. Um, okay. So, but, but there are lots of different types of access needs. Um, and uh, you'll hear about many of these um, embedded within our conversation tonight. One of the places where access needs and conflicting access needs come up relates to the chat. 
for many Brain Club participants, the chat is a way um, that makes it possible to participate in this program because it's a way of communicating without mouth words. It's a way of getting your ideas out, you know, with as much processing time or with as little impulse control or as little demand on working memory as possible. Um, at the same time, there are lots of participants for whom the chat is really cluttered. It's distracting. Many people even have a startle response to pop-ups. And especially if it moves quickly, it can be hard to follow. And uh, for, for our staff team, uh, we, we are cognitively fatigued. And sometimes we really can't keep up with the chat when it's used in certain ways. And we'll talk about that. There's going to be for about half of our time tonight, there's a pre-recorded panel interview. Um, it'll run about 30 minutes. And during the video, you are welcome um, to use the chat to ask questions of our team and our staff will respond to those questions. You can also make comments about what you're seeing in the video, but you also don't have to. You can completely ignore the chat because the main, the main act is on the screen. And you can, if, if you do want to use the chat, you can use that to validate other people's comments. You can share how something's being, that's being shared is impacting you. Um, again, and you can ask, ask questions. We just ask that you use the big chat box, the main chat box when you do that. Um, there's a, like, this reply feature kind of thing. It actually, that becomes an accessibility problem. That's what actually makes the chat bounce up and down. And that becomes really problematic for, for, uh, for, for, for lots of people who are trying to access the chat. So we just ask that you type here in the main big box. New tonight, um, inspired by uh, trying to recover from last week's technical stuff, uh, for those of you who were here with us last week, um, we have Cadence joining us today. Hi, Cadence. Thank you so much. So if you have tech problems or tech questions, we ask that you send a private chat message to tech support ABB, and Cadence will be responding to that. So we ask that you use a um, private chat messaging, not the public chat messaging that will help, you know, keep the um, visual clutter out of the chat so that people can, for other people can continue to use the chat um, without getting overwhelmed. So that will also get get you some support faster. So to you to send a private message, um, you're going to the chat box, but you're changing it. You're instead of usually it defaults to everyone in meeting, or uh, you're going to choose tech support, and then it'll show you oh. I tech support's getting a direct message and then you type your message and Cadence will get it. We hope that that will um, meet everyone's needs. Okay, if you, last thing about chat, if you are bothered by the chat popping up, um, after the first time it pops up, try not closing it, leave it open so that the text will update, but it won't pop, it only pops once. You can also try disabling chat preview. Um, there's the little up arrow next to the chat window on the bottom of your toolbar. You can tap on the word show chat preview and get rid of the check marks. So now there's no check box. Now it won't pop up anymore. So either way, that is a, a way that we try to navigate conflicting access needs and the chat. Okay. I'm exhausted even talking about the chat. So um, before we get into our topic, I did want to play um, a video to tell you about an upcoming program that we would love for folks to get connected with. Because of my own executive functioning, I did not think to load this up on the other computer, but we'll do our best. Here we go. Share screen. Oh, goodness. This is a community event yeah. for people who generally. Okay. Um, in August, August 24th is our third annual community health education fair um, that will have a hybrid format this year, both uh, live in person on the uh, Vermont State House lawn, but there will also be a component of the event um, thanks to our friends at Work and Media uh, a component of the event that will be live streamed that you'll be able to watch virtually. So here's a little bit about the event. 
This is a community event for people who generally can't access community events. People who they walk by the state house lawn and they're like, that, that's not for me. This is an event where you can say that, that is for me. With ABB, the pressure to appear the right way uh, just isn't there. It just feels like a different energy. Just free to be kind of who you were and in, in whatever space you were in at whatever time you were in it. Our community health education fair very intentionally has multiple ways of participating. You can visit the resource fair where a wide range of community organizations are there with free resources so that you don't need to go to individual websites and you don't need to make phone calls and like all the things that are so hard. I, I just don't see myself approaching a table talking to a stranger but there's a lot of other things to do activities for all ages you can do with others you can do side by side i don't have to make eye contact i don't have to behave any particular way no pressure to have a conversation unless you want to have a conversation i can do what i want to do and uh, other people around there are doing the exact same thing so it's an environment where that's safe it's sort of a smorgasbord kind of across that, the, the, you know, I, I think there's a real effort to, to be made that there's something there for everybody. And um, they'll. will be live music that oh, you can hang out and listen to a community. You're on mute, Mel. I don't know if you know Mel. Oh, no, I'm just fighting with my computer. Like, speaking of access to I don't have a mouse, and that makes the difference between my, my ability to do the thing and not do the thing. So thank you for, thank you for bearing with me. This is a community. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Jen. I can't even. I'm hold on. Ooh. I would love to tell you more about the event, but honestly, I think it's just time for us to start the video for tonight's topic because uh that's I think what this is gonna be about. because my trackpad is not, oh, it worked. <sighs> Thank you all for your patience. So um, our event, August 24th, um, as you heard, a variety of activities, um, including a really cool space called the Limelight Restoration Zone, where there'll be activities for all ages. Um, and a community storytelling event that is basically like Brain Club, um, but for several hours. Um, so we hope we hope you'll join us, um, whether you're local or uh, wherever wherever you live. We hope you participate in in one way or another. And Lizzie's going to drop a link in the chat to sign up for our newsletter if you're not there already, and that's the best place to um, receive the live the live stream link when it's available. Okay, so we are actually getting back to our conversation about the double empathy problem. So the double empathy problem, um, you know, as it relates to healthcare, um, I do need to give a content warning just for the next, I would say, two minutes um, uh, with some terrifying health data, um, uh, including healthcare trauma, um, a mention of um, premature death, suicide, and systemic ableism. Um, because what we know is that neurodivergent patients struggle to access healthcare. We know that autistic and ADHD uh, adults in particular have higher rates, far higher rates of uh, chronic illness, um, including a constellation of intertwined medical conditions that you'll hear more about tonight. Um, and uh, four times increased risk of premature death for ADHDers, for autistic adults, um, a life expectancy of 36 to 54 years of age, not dying from autism, dying from premature cardiovascular disease and suicide. 
And what we know is that there are extensive barriers to healthcare access that we talk about all the time at Brain Club and in webinars relating to the healthcare system and health, typical healthcare environments and insufficient knowledge, skills, and attitudes of healthcare providers um, that get in the way of providing adequate care to neurodivergent people. We know that medical education is really stuck in the early 1900s. Um, don't in this 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 is a study out of Kaiser from 2015 um, uh, about autism and primary care physicians' knowledge of autism, and it's really abysmal. Less than 10 percent of primary care physicians would ex would suspect that their patient were autistic if they volunteered information, showed interest in people discusses emotions and can see the whole picture. Yep. So when you're only trained in stereotypes, that's all you see. And um, what's entirely missing um, is the medical conditions that are so common in autistic and ADHD people um, relating to connective tissue, sleep, um, the gastrointestinal system, the immune system, um, everything being intertwined. Um, this, uh, this, this constellation um, uh, that in our medical practice of mostly autistic and ADHD patients, not, not, uh, not exclusively by any means, um, but in our patient practice, 95% um, of our autistic and ADHD adults suffer from this constellation of intertwined medical problems. And the problem is that the healthcare system gets in the way of clinicians managing these problems because um, the management of some parts of this cluster make the other parts worse. And so the healthcare system makes everyone fit into the, you know, the 10 minute boxes, like fragment the body parts, whereas these things are connected. And sometimes um, some, let's say medications prescribed for one part of this cluster make the other parts worse. And so it really interferes with people getting better. And so um, uh, some examples of some of the uh, component conditions that are part of this constellation, hypermobility spectrum disorder, um, including hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, POTS, dysautonomia, mast cell activation, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, range of sleep disorders, et cetera, et cetera. These things are common and they are all connected. And by zooming out and treating these conditions appropriately connected because they are, um, this really can result in people making um, more improvements um, a lot faster. And so um, our, last year uh, with uh, support from the Organization on Autism Research and HRSA's Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health grant, um, we together with 100 of our community members uh, created this resource called our Everything's Connected to Everything Project, Improving the Healthcare of Autistic and ADHD Adults. It's a free resource um, for patients and clinicians about how to identify and work through these problems together. So uh, um, hopefully uh, Lizzie or Sarah can drop a link to that in the chat. Um, so, you know, I would imagine that um, within within our our you know brain club, of course, is always going to draw a um, you know a, a group of mixed neurotype folks, um, professionals, non professionals, um, not not healthcare professionals, right? So just it's gonna, we're gonna have a, a mixed crowd here, but I would imagine it's pretty common um, that people have had some pretty bad experiences with the healthcare system in this audience, right? So um, uh, we 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 cover that at Brain Club a lot. Um, and these are just some examples. And maybe uh, Lizzie, we didn't really prepare for this, but um, the the link should be in the in in the webinar scripts document um, to drop these brain club recordings for people who want to like um, spend some time thinking about the experience of neurodivergent healthcare and hear more about that. Um, tonight we're 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 again we're we're in this this lens of the double empathy problem. Um, so uh, we're always trying to bridge gaps in worldview and communication style. And so even built into our Everything's Connected to Everything document, we have this letter that patients can print out. It's written in the language that doctors are used to speaking and receiving information. Um, so it's a letter written by doctors for doctors to read being introduced to this project. 
And this way, patients don't have to like contort themselves to fit in the 10 minute appointment and say the just right words so that they can get the attention and the you know understanding of what 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 they're needing some support around. Um, so we we welcome you to again check out this resource and try to use this tool. Um, uh, and 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 it really we get we've gotten really good feedback that this letter works the best if you say you print it out, you bring it to your next appointment, and you just hand the letter without necessarily accompanying it with a lot of extra information. Just let the letter um, uh, work for you so that it takes the burden off of you to come up with the quote, right things to say. There is, of course, no right thing to say. Um, but um, see, we hope and uh, we'd love, love, love to hear feedback um, for anyone who tries this. Because uh, much like um, the original use of the term, the double empathy problem, this term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, an autistic social scientist in the UK, who's, who referred to and, and found in research, and this has been uh, repeatedly found, that uh, miscommunications happen um, when there is a mismatch of neurotypes. So for example, um, you know, uh, autistic people might be able to communicate back and forth with, you know, no problem. Um, but um, non-autistic people have a really hard time in perspective taking and in trying to understand an autistic person's worldview and communication style and vice versa. It's not that there's one normal type of communication and then, you know, there's, there's, there's the people who don't do it right over there. Um, so we're applying this concept to healthcare. And so tonight you're going to hear from um, uh, myself and uh, my two colleagues at All Brains Belong, uh, Sierra Miller and Dr. Gabor Zawad, um, talking about this concept of how does the healthcare system interfere with um, patients and clinicians being able to speak each other's language? Because um, again, um, uh, we, we've, we've covered how bad things are out there in the world. Um, that is, that is well, well established. It's really, where do we go from here? How do we bridge the double empathy problem? Because that is going to make the difference. That is going to be able to shift, um, professionals struggling themselves within the system to learn another way of doing things because it's not the fault of any individual. It's the system thwarting everyone. So um, with that, I'm going to shift to my other computer and share screen. Hang on. This one's actually queued up and ready to go, I promise. is neurodivergent health, you know, as as, as I, I think we should, I think, I think we should share with our audience that, you know, not all our patients are neurodivergent um, and certainly not all our patients I would identify as being a neurodivergent. Um, uh, and they come because their needs were not met by the traditional healthcare system. That's what they have in common. That's what they all have in common. Um, and amongst that group, um, the overwhelming majority of our patients have this pattern, right, of neuroimmune conditions. Um, I think they most often talk about not feeling listened to or heard. Um, and I know that's kind of a vague thing, but um, I think being feeling like they're having their symptoms dismissed, whether that's because, oh, you're young and no, you shouldn't, you can't be in that much pain, you can't have this thing, or, um, oh, this disorder is so rare, you couldn't have it. Um, I was talking to another provider about, you know, yeah. neurodivergent healthcare and how common, how some medical conditions tend to coexist. And that there's like actual literature and papers out there about it. And this is someone who's probably like five to 10 years my senior. Like they've been in practice that much longer than me and they had no idea. They're right. like, I didn't know that 
you know, these things happen together. Um, and so I think the issue is that these things are not on people's radar that because it's not being taught. Well. Right. So let's start there. So what do what do you remember? Um, if anything about what you were taught about autism and ADHD? Nothing. I had no idea they could coexist. Yeah. I was never taught that they could co coexist. Yeah. Despite yeah. they almost like they, they, they coexist more often than they don't. Right. Yeah. I feel like for me, autism education was like developmental milestones and m chat and that type of stuff for kids and then adhd was this happens in kids and we use stimulants to treat it and then yeah they were very like, they were separate i mean i was not taught that autistic physiology was different than non-autistic people's physiology like I was taught, I mean, like, so, I mean, there was, there, there was like, so, you know, the deficit based paradigm of like, you know, here are the things that, that are wrong. Um, and, and we call this autism, um, in kids, there was never a discussion about autistic adults. Um, I don't know, like, I don't think that I had any ideas about autistic adults, despite being one and not knowing. Um, but like I uh, like like it was just never on the radar that like there were autistic adults, let alone the medical conditions that people have. So like when the list of all the co-occurring conditions, these are all things that kids had. Yep. Um, there was also like you know the 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 medical conditions that all the autistic kids had they were it was very strongly implied if not explicitly taught to me that there was it was like patient blaming you know like you have gastrointestinal things because you you only eat chicken nuggets and pasta and you don't exercise so that's why you're constipated like not that you have stretchy right. colons that get all get, get all stretched out right per increased periodontal disease because of not doing oral hygiene right 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 i mean and this is this is more systemic right in the in the healthcare system but the the zoomed in uh, style of teaching like you know there's psychology psychiatry and there's gastroenterology and there are all these things that are separated and but mm -hmm. in reality there are so many things that are interconnected that it's it's silly that we're not taught more of a like zoomed out picture. This is like a an entire being that is has multiple systems that actually work together and rely on each other and are influenced by like how your DNA is being transcribed. And um, it's it's just it's unfortunate that that zoomed out more of that zoomed out approach to teaching medicine isn't taught because it results in the in the zoomed in like looking at these two things that you already know coexist and not seeing the the bigger connections with some of these other things and how um you know how that impacts people in the healthcare system impacts patients in particular yes and i think that what you said is really interesting because i i think that I would describe my medical education as being very top down. An autistic patient is more likely to have X, Y, and Z list of conditions. Top down, you memorize the associations and they're tested on board exams. But that's not how the patient comes in. The patient comes in bottom up and in a healthcare system that is so fragmented, like you said, um, the opportunity, the pattern is not created in a zoomed out enough approach. The pattern is created with way too, and even, even people with the type of brains that are really good at pattern matching, the, 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 the whole picture of the pattern was not taught because it's not known. 
And one of the reasons it's not is that these these patients are thought to be rare, right? So so if if what's described is that two percent of adults are autistic, I mean, there's zero chance that that's true. It would need to be more than that. Um, but anyway, it's thought to be it's thought to be rare. So why would we make why 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 would medical education be structured on this entity that is that is rare? Because there because what's missed is that the neuroimmune conditions that are more common in autistic and ADHD people are connected to the things that are known to be very common. So, you know, when we think about like in our practice, right, how we, we see a lot of mast cell dysfunction and guess what? That's connected to diabetes and hypertension and like all the things, right? So, so right. And IBS and mood, uh, anxiety, migraine, I mean, migraines, it's, like, it's connected to everything, but yet, yeah, no, it's zoomed out enough to really. I think that's what primes primary care providers for doing this type of work is because theoretically they're the ones who are already doing that kind of like look at the full body and the full patient and they're the ones who are seeing all the different things that are going on and know the patient longitudinally, longitudinally enough um, to theoretically be able to kind of see the connection between everything. But what I would say is that um, even though we have a, a, a population of clinicians who are ideally poised to spot the pattern, we have a medical system, a healthcare system that is thwarting primary care clinicians to have full access to their cortex, right? Like, so we have this, like, this healthcare system that is forcing primary care clinicians to see, you know, a patient every 10 minutes, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And most practices are 15 minute visits for follow ups, 30 minute visits for new patients, or, you know, uh, wellness exams or whatever. And on top of that, you're managing an electronic medical record system and paperwork and interpersonal work stuff. It's like you you have you have five five or ten jobs within one job already, and so not not I don't want to. There's no the blame is the system. I don't think that people go into medicine intentionally wanting to dismiss people at all. But it's just it's something that ends up happening. You know, you're exhausted, you're tired, you you didn't eat breakfast, you didn't have time to eat lunch, and then you're and then you just you lose um um what's it called? You get dysregulated. But on there's there's a line that that happens, and you're like backed up against the wall and feel like you you know in some some ways it may be the provider kind of. Um, advocating for their own access needs by saying, okay, we don't have time to talk about this today, but not knowing that, that that's how that makes someone feel. You, you don't have the cognitive resources to do what needs doing in that moment because the system is thwarting you. And so you, you're, anyway, you don't have the ability in that moment to zoom out because that's an executive function. It's like a higher order brain skill to zoom out, to self monitor, to know like what you're saying, how you're saying your tone, your body language, all of this stuff. And I right. think that there's a lot of, you know, really inadvertent um, communication breakdowns. That uh, yeah. Unintentional dismissiveness. Yeah. I think like what we, what I, what I hear a lot, like when we have new patients, you know, the overwhelming majority of our patients have this pattern, right, of neuroimmune conditions, um, that, that there is physiology that explains these multi-organ system symptoms. People show up and they have like this laundry list of diagnoses um, and like, why would it make sense that a human being would have like 40 things wrong with them? Um, you know, turns out, you know, their connective tissue is different. Um, it's, it's just a different way of being wired. And it just so happens that these physical health conditions, which, you know, are, are, are exacerbated 
by dysregulation. And when your access needs are thwarted by like, you know, all of the systems, um, this actually drives like a worsening of neuroimmune conditions. But people don't right. know that. Nobody yeah. knows that. Yeah. They just like feel broken and they're told that they are broken and then they're like shamed for seeking help. So like, anyway, shamed for seeking help, shamed for seeking help in the way that you authentically communicate when you seek help and shamed for not complying with recommendations that don't work for your brain. Right. When, 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 when we hear their story, we can trace this back for like decades, right? Like decades. Yeah. Um, and it's about having the, the opportunity to share your story in the way that works for you. So some people need to info dump their story with mouth words. Some people need to bring a list. <laughs> yes, right, they, right, they, right. They're the patient with the list, right? The one that's like shamed and othered by the healthcare system. They, yeah. they wrote that list, and that list is incredibly important because because it has all the information in it. Like anyway, there's some people like uh, you know we we have a patient who I'll never forget. A new patient visit, uh, you know, brought a mind map that showed me like you know all the things that like this makes it worse, this makes it better, and I'm like I know that pattern, right? So like if you get the if you get the patient's information in like their so say like in their native tongue, like in their in yeah, the way that yeah. in the way that they best communicate. You get a ton more information, but the system thwarts patients from communicating. The people come in. I think the other thing that I often see, especially with kids coming in with neurodivergent kids, especially, is just that they have not been able to um, access care in other settings, um, just due to the like sensory overload of the specific setting, um, and so. Yeah, whether it's like providers not um, knowing their sensory needs beforehand, before actually coming into the visit or like just before walking into the room, um, oh, like, whether it's um, like the fluorescent lights, whether it's thinking that they're going to need a vaccine the entire visit and being anxious and not interacting the entire visit until they know they don't need one at the end. Um, and that's why I like having the like information before a visit of what somebody needs, what their sensory needs are, because starting off the visit that way makes such a huge difference. And if we didn't have that, I wouldn't know necessarily. Well, um, you left something out. How do we have that information? We asked, right? Like, like that's, that's the thing, right? So if you ask people, what makes them comfortable and you ask and you and like you try to do those things, they usually have a better healthcare experience. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's just the systems within the systems already have like there's right, their standard expectation. Like this is how you communicate, this is how you take information. Like, you know, people people teach you how to how to take notes. Like when you're in when you're in school, here's how here's how you study something without ever knowing how your brain works. Like and and then you try to fit yourself and mold your brain and your way your whole way of being into the box that who knows who designed it, but the box that has become like the, the standard expectation of how how to communicate, how to interact, how to socialize, how to just exist, how to be within the workplace. Um and and it's 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 suffocating yeah i mean i remember even like as a pre-med student like you know my volunteer gigs or like some of my jobs after college before medical school like it was just so clear that there was judgment going on and that that what you just said like you know that there's one right way to do the thing there's one like, like it was just so clear that it was not okay to show up as as one's true self not not just as as a professional like as a patient 
like I remember being like a young 20 something and I remember being like, you know, oh, I hope like I have to do something. I have to do something to make sure they don't think I'm weird or that I'm like melodramatic or that, you know, anyway, I have all the things. I have all the things. I've always had all the things. Um, I, I, as a patient, I've never, you know, I, I, I've never had care for my all the things because I never tell anyone my all the things because that's a surefire where to get judged. <laughs> yes. Not because it's funny, it's just, it's, it's, it's one of those, it's just act in this way, communicate in this way, or you will go unheard. Yes. Like you have to, you have to communicate a certain way or, or you, you won't be heard and not everybody can make that adjustment. And so those are the, those are the people that are staying away from healthcare because it's overwhelming or confusing or uncomfortable or unsafe to. Yeah. I, see, yeah. I feel like I say that so commonly, like if if I'm talking to somebody about like being in a pre-diabetic range and before I even say anything, they start with, but I eat well and I've been struggling with my weight in my entire life and like preface it with like, I'm doing all the things, please don't blame it on me being at fault or, or blame it on my weight. Um, and it's just so ingrained in patients to kind of preface a visit with these are all the things that I'm doing because otherwise it's so common for it to because that's how we learn that's we learn that diabetes is lifestyle factor related and that's the only thing versus inflammation and genetics and all the other things and that mast cells to do to it right right and that like weight isn't always totally changeable well it's also that like i mean i mean this is this is like such a bigger picture like so not only is there a right way to be a person but but like the message that there's a right way to be healthy too and like so you know when you think about like all of the anti-fat bias and shaming that goes on in the healthcare system i mean it starts in childhood i mean it's just it's yeah. it's so bad yeah, I think shame shame is unfortunately one of those one of those things that is I I don't even know why either taught from the very beginning. You mm -hmm. know, as children. I wish that it were normalized to say when you don't know instead what is modeled or what was modeled for me as a trainee is that you fake it till you make it and that when someone says a thing that doesn't match your worldview you quackify them well that's not a thing um, i remember hearing in medical school um and thankfully i had a nutritional biochemistry background so they said that taking vitamins is just paying for really expensive pee and I was like, they were like, well, why would they say that? Because they stopped taking the vitamins because they felt guilty and shame. And I was like, because they don't know biochemistry. They don't they don't understand that nutritional needs of different humans are, are just as different as the brains that are operating. So instead of saying, I don't really understand how the human cell and mitochondria and all of these different vitamins and minerals interact. So I'm going to say that um, taking vitamins is stupid. You can get enough from what you eat. And um, and then and then I'm going to teach that to people that are training under me who are then going to say these things to patients. And we all just don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> yep. I remember being taught that people quote outgrow ADHD, kids outgrow ADHD. And you know, I believe that I was taught it despite being an, you know, an undiagnosed ADHD -er. like anyway, that kind of mythology is just so widely held. It's the same way. Like I remember as a trainee, you know, the, pa the, the patient with the list. Um, and like, I thought that was awesome because I'm a visual processor and I wanted to read the list. And, um, uh, but, but anyway, that person gets shamed. But also like the patient that comes in and says, you know, I read about this on, you know, WebMD or some other website and like I read this article and I want you to like, you know, how does this fit into my, like I, 
I don't know. I just always thought that was awesome because they like they were engaged in their health. And anyway, it 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 doesn't. It's it's not that hard to be like. I don't know about this. Thanks for the article. I'll read it. And we can talk about it again next time. It's not that hard, but that's not model. The opposite of that is 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 model. But like right. in the context of what we talked about before, where the system is like, you know, you must see the patient every 10 to 15 minutes. Like, so now I have something else to do. Right. So it's 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 <laughs> unfortunately, I think within the medical community, it's learned behavior and learned behavior from maybe you know someone else's teachings that the list is bad and those those patients are compl complicated and you know the eye rolling and and all that kind of stuff it's all it's it's learned we weren't we weren't taught how to how to really manage that you know yeah. as a you know um well just see them more often right wow okay right <laughs> Right. It's that easy. It is that easy. <laughs> and I think like coming back to the like not feeling comfortable saying you don't know things like there's this expectation that a healthcare provider is a knows everything about every single body system. And that's that's not feasible for anybody, I think. I mean, I right. certainly don't know everything about every body system. Like primary care is really hard. And right. Yeah. Primary care is really hard. There's so much to know. There's so much to spot. You're on the front lines, and then you have the system thwarting you, your ability to do what you're trying to do for your patients. Um, you don't have full access to your cortex, and you're trying to survive. And like, it, it feels a lot like treading. You know, it's like it, treading water and like trying trying to survive and trying to do everything you can for your patients. Um, there's just it's so much. Yeah. And I think for those in traditional primary care practices, um, whether you're hospital owned or private, I mean, what's normalized is the dysfunction of the system. It's yeah. like, yep, this is just the way it is. So, you know, so that's what we have to do. So we're just going to keep yeah. doing it. And uh, just felt like there has to be a better way to do this, but like everyone's stuck it's a failure of imagination, right? So like what we do all day, I mean, the only reason we're really able to do it is because we don't have a bureaucracy. Like the patients need a thing and we kind of like try to figure out how to do that thing. Um, and like a system, systems get dysfunctional. I mean, like I think individual providers are most frequently operating in systems where they don't have autonomy or agency to do all things like when I do trainings for like in services for healthcare practices um, or even like at you know conferences like people are like oh yeah that's really great that you can do that thing in your in your special setting um, but like you know us 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 people in the trenches um, you know what 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 about us and it'd be good to, to to wrap up maybe talking about like what are some things not just like you know what are the medical conditions we manage and how do we manage them but like what are some like what are some things we do that are free to do that like i don't know are different than 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 than, in, than other settings because i think that one of the things that we do is i think we we teach patients that they are the experts in their own bodies many of them don't know that this is like new information that they're getting that lens is really a requirement for, for trusting your intuition, for connecting all the dots, for learning about your access needs and naming it when they're not met. If you don't think that you're the expert in your own self, because you got messages to the contrary your whole life, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely um, definitely makes a big difference. I think as a practice, us, you know, before patients even come in, we're asking them before they even become our patient. They know that we care about how they learn information, how they would like visits to go. It giving people. Uh, choices of 
sensory needs and ways to access care. And a lot of those are free, like turning off the fluorescent lights in an office um, or letting people bring fidgets and whatever they want with them and making that explicit that like you can bring whatever you want with you. Having things in the office for people to be able to write their own notes so they don't have to bring their own things. I think we uh, we often get feedback, right, that patients have never been asked for what they need. But the fact that we asked means that we care and that makes right. that patient that much more comfortable to share things in their like authentic, unique way. Right. And the fact that, you know, like like you said before, Gabe, about how, you know, we were trained to ask questions a certain way. Like, guess what? There are some brains who can't answer questions in the way that they're being asked in that default way. And so, like, just the idea of, you know, open-ended questions do not work for all brains. And the idea of providing people with a menu for examples of, like, these are, these are things we offer all people with all types of brains. And you can let us know if any of these things would be helpful to you. And it's not because you have you know, an issue, you don't have a sensory issue or a communication issue. It's that you would just find these things helpful to have available to you. That's all. The other thing that I think that I've learned in this past year and a half is that like about just the idea of healthcare as community. Mm. And yeah. I think, I think that has really, really stayed with me because I think I think that's what I think that's what one of the one of the key things that we're doing. I mean, like it's not for everybody. That's why we try to be really transparent about the model here and you know have people not not join, not come when they're not looking for this model. But remember at my my old practice in a traditional setting, I remember meeting with people back to back who were, had no friends, totally socially isolated. And it was like, they actually like loved the same things. And like the healthcare system says that you, you know, HIPAA, you know, you can't do anyway. But like, turns out like they can introduce themselves to one another if you build a forum that they would both come to. Like, think about how much we have learned from patients, like coming as this, as this, as this village. Like when we think about like, all these really complicated medical conditions that most of the healthcare system doesn't understand. When you bring patients together and you give people an opportunity to describe in their own ways what their experience is like and what helps and does not help, people feel alone. They feel just alone in their lives. And once they know that they're not, there's so much healing in that. Sarah. Um. I love that ending and it makes me think of everything that we're trying to do at All Brands Belong. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm the community programs coordinator here at All Brands Belong. And so I think about our kid connections program that Mel mentioned in the chat, which matches kids ages four to 17 with another kid who has the same interests. So it's an it's a, uh, a matchmaking uh, program based on shared interests. And I think about how powerful that is for kids to find someone else who loves what you love and um, how that is healthcare and how our traditional system doesn't think of it as healthcare. Um, but when I hear feedback from parents about the program, um, one of the quotes that we've shared before, I think, is that a parent asked their 17 year old, you know, what do you what do you think about the Kid Connections program? And they said, so this is what it feels like to have a friend. You know, it's powerful stuff. And and I think about that 
um, for adults in our community as well. It's not just kids. So I think about Brain Club and all the community programs that we do, the Community Health Education Fair coming up, you know, next month. And I just think about how in a traditional system, it would be like, all right, I'll write you this prescription and send you on your way without really considering how is this person feeling about their life? Are they feeling connected to friends? What's their employment situation? You know, what types of relationships do they have in their life uh, to support them? And, um, you know, just being in a community, even just that brain club of being surrounded by others who get it and who can say, I feel that way too. I've gone through that as well. Um, you know, there's so much power in that. And and it it's just so, so deeply tied to, you know, your physical health. It's it's not like mental health and physical health. It's all health. And so that's something that I've learned through um, being a part of ABB. Wow. Well, I can't think of a, a better way to to wrap up than, than that note, Sarah, thank you. And thank you all so much for being, being part of our community. Um, cause I, I could not agree more. This is healthcare. This, this experience of bringing people together and shifting, shifting our old narratives that no longer serve us and, and, and learning, learning a new path forward. So, uh, with that, um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Um, next week, um, we will be joined um, asynchronously, um, but but um, but joined um, by um, Maisie Satanyu, um, who is an autistic entrepreneur, um, who will be having a conversation with me about um, autistic employment and bridging the double empathy problem in employment. And um, uh, we're spending a lot of time talking about uh, the impact of autistic burnout and employment. So it's a, it's a really it's a really powerful conversation, and I look forward to sharing it with you next week. Have a good week. Bye.